Howdy, Earth Fans. It's Woody. Today, we're in Yosemite National Park, one of the jewels of the national park system, with our new friends, Jamie and Catherine, from Echo Adventure Cooperative in Groveland, California. It's the gateway to one of our most beautiful national parks in the United States. I'm gonna let Jamie and Catherine tell you guys what they do, a little bit about their cooperative, which is a really unique nature and conservation B Corp. They take people out on adventures and healing trips in Yosemite National Park. Jamie, start with you and let us know what you do there. Well, I work as a guide here in Yosemite and a couple years ago, Elizabeth Bryant and myself started Echo Adventure Cooperative. This is a way to kind of give back to the community, give back to the guides, give back to the environment and especially to our clients, our guests. It's definitely a pretty awesome, fun time getting to take people out on adventures in Yosemite, make sure they ex to experience it in what I think is hopefully the right way. And learning about, you know, taking care of Mother Earth and Mother Nature and learning what that can even mean. And yeah, a lot about leave no trace ethics and all that fun stuff. And you're one of the founding partners, correct? Yes, I am. And tell us a little bit about the B Corp and the how you guys found the, the organization. And... Well, we found, founded Echo as a cooperative to kind of give back to some of those core principles that we really love and take care of. And that kind of really just fed into like, oh, there's also this beautiful accreditation that kind of goes along with that. And it's always nice to have this stamp of approval that says, you guys are doing good. This is the right direction. Other people think it's good, right? It's just pretty awesome. It's definitely a, a way to show to the world that yes, what we are doing is either good for in the environment and good for, you know, socially for everybody involved. And Catherine, tell us what you do with yeah, thanks. So I, I'm the newest member of Echo Adventure Cooperative. I uh, just joined in August 2019 and I'm responsible for the entire wellness leg of our organization. So I come in with um, Reiki and meditation and yoga and massage, but also coupling that with outdoor retreats and outdoor adventures is a wonderful way to connect people to their own inner nature while experiencing mother nature. You guys brought us to a couple of different places in the park. We went to Glacier Point, a couple of views, the Brattleville Falls. We saw the, the actual two Yosemite Falls, is that correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then our final place we came is here, and we're, we're in the giant sequoias, in the area of the giant sequoias. So tell us, you guys were telling us some really interesting things about the giant sequoias. Let, tell us a little bit about that, Jamie. So we get to be with the giant sequoias, which are the most voluminous living organisms on Earth. They're just ancient beings. They can be like two to 3,000 years old. Some of them, this grove around here, we're in there like 1,800 years old. You know, they can survive through fire. They need fire to reproduce, all sorts of amazing things, so. And you told us cool. that they grow in a swath of land two or 300 miles long. And, and a couple of miles wide. So it's not that large of an area that they do grow in. It's pretty amazing. They're only here on the western slope of the Sierra Nevada at about 6,000 feet of elevation. So not too many places you really can go and see them. And we're actually currently sitting on one, right? Yeah, there's some of those fallen giants. Pretty awesome. Yeah, so occasionally they'll fall over, they get hit by lightning. The drought will maybe cause them to die. Other trees might fall against them and fall over, and they essentially just turn into biomass. The national park system in the United States is extensive. There's a lots of, of areas that have been protected like this, and it's great to get out here and take notes. Permaculture, we teach observation skills is one of the most important mm -hmm. things, and whether that's on your farm in your backyard, or whether it's out going out into other people's farms or going out into our beautiful parks like this and, and sitting down and listening to Mother Nature, taking notes, listening to the babbling brooks. And then out here specifically, I've really noticed a lot of the burn areas. The burn areas, a lot of the trees will fall over or they'll intentionally cut them over and they'll lay down in over four, five, six, seven years that those trees turn into this magical, biomass that is just soil building essentially and that soil you'll see all of the new trees popping up and coming through and you can observe here in the, in the national park certain areas that have all of this biomass and if you you hike down the hills and into the creek beds you you can literally make the connections and see the results of this biomass as a water holding capacity or a capacitor if you will for water and, and it slowly sinks the water down into the, the water system or the water 
uh, supply and into the creek beds. And Jamie had a really nice uh, observation earlier about Brattleville Falls compared to the other waterfalls. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah, definitely looking at differences between Brattleville Falls and Yosemite Falls. Like the upper area where Yosemite Falls comes from is glaciated, scraping across the landscape and leaving just bare open granite. You can compare that to like cement or just any open rock or anything like that. And that waterfall dries up every year. Drought, no drought, every year it dries up. Of course, you take that compared to something like Bridal Vale Falls, unglaciated on top. And of course, that has that nice spongy layer up top, holds all that water. Of course, that one runs year round. And I mean, you can even look at the footage from today and see quite the difference in the amount of water coming out of each one. And Bridal Vale will last throughout the year. Just through our visual observations of looking at the area above Brattleville Falls, you could see the, the biomass. There are some burn areas, but they're all coming back and regrowing, it mm -hmm. seems. They're, they've replanted themselves. It didn't seem like the most of the fires didn't burn so hot that they just totally decimated everything. So a lot of the pines and the conifers are coming back. Tell us a little bit about, if you will, about some of the different types of conifers that grow here, Catherine. And right here we see um, some sugar pines and white firs mostly, but down on the valley floor we saw a lot of ponderosa pines, and then as we get up higher in altitude you'll see red firs and things like that. We also have a, a bunch of dogwood um, right around us right now, and that grows all over the park. Some of the other things, the lower scrub brush that you guys were talking about, give some examples of that. Oh, definitely the chaparral. And I mean, mm -hmm. that's pretty important for everything. It's gen different generations of forests, like manzanita. Manzanita is extremely hardwood. It's probably, mm -hmm. they say it's more flammable than gasoline. Yeah. Because this idea like chaparral, brushy stuff is what we call it, is like almost made to consume fire as much as fire consumes it. Yeah. It's wow. huge and really important for, you know, these generations keep moving along in a forest. One of the nice things that we've we've noticed about the national park here is that it's it's a probably 50% or 40% of, of of normal capacity, and so there's seemingly more wildlife. We've seen four bears today, which is really nice. Um, lots Handful of, of does, does, lots of ducks. And, yeah, yeah I don't just, see this many bears. I can tell you that. Yeah, this is special. Yeah, so th there are some upsides, it seems, to, to the COVID, and may maybe th this is a, a, an example of where we might go with some of the overrun parks and, and just require, there are some upsides and downsides to that, but we encourage all of you guys, our audience especially, to get out in the parks uh, beyond your comfort zone, spend the night, camp on the ground, uh, go barefooted, uh, really just sit and observe and take notes and see how biodynamic and how magnificent and productive mother nature can be and to maybe mock or, or to to mimic some of those systems in your own systems that you're building in your backyards um what else can can you guys say about tell us a little bit about healing in places like this Catherine. why is it important to to protect these types of places in the united states and as well as the rest of the world yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Um, so I've, I've heard stories and seen people, you know, have these just wonderfully profound experiences when they come into Yosemite National Park and they see, you know, these 3000 foot monoliths just jetting up out of the valley floor. And it's just awe inspiring and, and so breathtaking that people have, you know, said to drop to their knees in tears because they're just overwhelmed with the pure beauty of the place. And then they have to leave and go back home. And how can I bottle this up and take this with me once I leave? And, and so where I come in is I just, I like to help people recognize that they can harness that inner calm and that peace that they find in nature. It is with, you, it is with us always. And that ability is there um, anytime, even if you do live in an urban sprawl or anything like that. But what better way to connect with that part of yourself than doing it in a place that's as magical as this? Tell us a little bit about, since you're talking, go ahead and tell us a little bit about your where you live, your home, and what you guys have created as a family. Tell us a little bit about your family. Yeah, thanks. So live. I have two kids. I've got two boys, and my husband and I bought a house in 2017 in Groveland, California. It's got a couple acres. We've got a little mini farm with some animals. We've got about 50 chickens and we sell their eggs to our local community. And you know, it hasn't been a bad place to shelter in during this COVID time. 
right now. It's been it's been a pretty wonderful place for my family to to be. I came out here in 2011 to pursue a job fighting fire for the Forest Service and leaving the finance world behind because I had graduated with a finance background. So I jumped from the finance world into fire and now I'm in wellness. So it, I think it really, you know, this place can really transform a person in finding what it is that you really want to do. What is your purpose? What is your, you know, what is your goal in life? Tell us a little about your your food supply at your home. Just real short in, in y'all's water. Like where do you, do you, are you on municipal water? Supply? So we are on municipal water in Groveland. We've put in a ground mounted solar system at our house. Uh, we are looking at the next project for us is to be putting a, a, a metal roof over our composite roof that we already have. So we'll just put a metal roof over that and then um, some catchment for the rain. And that's, that's our next project. We have a small garden and we're working on expanding that as well. And the kids love to help with that. We grow berries at our house like crazy. We've got blackberries and raspberries and figs and apples and all kinds of things that- Chickens? Yeah, yeah. Good, and Jamie, you live on a small- His is much larger farm. actually, it's 40 something acres. 39. Oh, 38. 39 30. acres, you raise sheep, pigs, goats, um, have about a half acre garden, which sometimes more than enough. As you know, it's gonna be, yeah, things get out of control pretty quick. And then another big or decent sized orchard there that we've been working on building up, you know, those take time and stuff on. That's all built on swales and contour and everything like that. And it's pretty fun, we're completely off the grid. So that's got its own, you know, set of rules and different things you gotta work on and work by. We're definitely, you know, have our own well, our own power system with you know, it's all recycled batteries from Antarctica, which is pretty cool, different fun stuff like that. And nice. yeah. And so how did you get into this area? Of, how did you work into this? Did you just grow up and decide you were gonna be an orthoparian or did you turn into one? How did I? Well, I, don't know, I think for me, it really all stems back to the food. You know, I grew up cooking. My grandmother was a nutritionist. My grandmother also ran, helped run, and my grandfather ran a summer camp. So it all kind of came tied together. And after a while, I was like, I really like you know, there's food out in the world, food out in nature. You can find all this stuff there, stuff like that. Growing food, just part of, you know, I found my time in the garden as part of time of cooking. I find my time butchering animals, just a form of, you know, continuing of cooking and learning and kind of being part of that. And you want those good things going into you. You want it to be good and awesome and happy and you want it to see it happy. And so, you know, it's you, good. Yeah, you got to take care of it and work on it in a certain way. and. You just seem to be some of the certain rules laid out to like these equal good things and happy things and you can continue using it. Having, you know, happy sheep and goats means happy pastures and working on the soil there and making sure that it's filled with awesome, you know, native grasses and different great stuff and trucking sure. along, yeah. I had one of the best uh, ranchers I've ever met tell me one time, he said, Woody, basically, if I love my animals and I treat them with respect, and then I harvest that meat and I sell it to my customers. I transfer that love in, to my customers. Yeah, and what better way of that love? You know, this like, people think it's weird. Like, to put it kind of crudely, I eat my pets, right? <laughs> like, you eat your pets, it's kind of weird. But like, what better way than that love than like, if I eat it, they're becoming part of me. Like there's times where I'm just like, you know, before the meal, I'm like, it's Petunia. Thank you, Petunia. You know, you, you thank the animal. You thank them that becoming part of you and that energy becomes part of you, you know, and. You know, if it's eating some crude, weird stuff you got at, you know, some wholesale shop, it's not fun, but it's eating good stuff you grew and it's happy. And and speaking of that, does it, the, the full circle of life, do, do, do you guys, are you on a septic system or how, how does uh, you? We use, we just have a simple composting toilet. Pretty easy. And using you human manure, that's pretty great, pretty awesome. They say it's good after a year, we let it sit for three, just to, you know, make it happy. It can, might as well. Um, and use that in our pastures and then in our orchard as well. Nice. Yeah. Thank you guys for coming out with us today. It's been a fantastic hike. You guys have, have taught us a lot. You guys are definitely Earthoparians. So it was great to meet you guys. We knew immediately when we walked into Echo and we saw what you guys were about that, that y'all fit the bill for our show and you're gonna have to live up to it. So I'm Woody. I'm an Earthoparian. You too can be an Earthoparian. We'll see you next time. If you enjoyed our video, like, share, and subscribe below. And remember, 
When you heal the earth, you heal yourself. 